Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 UN South Asia Forum on Business and Human Rights. This is the uh, session titled, The Next Decade of Action, Connecting the Sustainable Development and Business and Human Rights. I am Prabina Shrestha from Q Design, and I will be a technical facilitator for today. Both the chat function and Q&A will be open. So if you have any questions for the speakers, please use the Q&A function. Please note that the session today is recorded. If you have any questions about Zoom or require technical assistance, please feel free to privately message TF Prabina for help using the chat box. I will now hand over to Livio Sarandrea, who is the UNDP Global Advisor for Business and Human Rights. Um, Livio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Prabina. And a very warm welcome to the session, The Next Decade of Action, Connecting Sustainable Development and Business and Human Rights. Now, those familiar uh, with both the 2030 Agenda and the UNGPs might have captured from the play on words that we used in the title, the reference to two key processes. Uh, one started a few months ago and, and the, the other starting very soon, in fact, both of which will keep us all busy for the next uh, 10 years. And these two processes are the next decade of action for the goals uh, for the SDGs called, uh, called for by the UN Secretary General started uh, in September uh, last year and meant to accelerate the implementation of the, 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 the SDGs. And the second is the next decade of the UN guiding principles on business uh, and human rights, an initiative launched by the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights last year in partnership with UNDP and the Office of the Air Commissioner of Human Rights. It's, it's an initiative that uh, has already been investing uh, 10 months and will invest at least two more months uh, into uh, researching, analyzing, and studying, uh, collecting information, uh, feed into a roadmap uh, for the implementation of, of the uh, UNGPs in the next um, in this next decade. Now, during this session, uh, we will ask um, the opinion of an esteemed group of experts, certainly, and but then also I would very much like to involve all of those who are participating in, in this session, in the discussion on how can these two efforts, uh, the acceleration of the UNGP for the last decade and the roadmap for the implementation of the UNGPs in the next decade be aligned uh, be coherent uh, and build on each other. Obviously, we will place this conversation in, in the regional context of South Asia, which is the, the geographic focus of this forum. So I'm hoping to steer a conversation which is uh, rich as much as possible of, of concrete and realistic, I stress, realistic recommendation, but also in inspiring, hopefully, case studies and examples which are always important in conversations like this. I promise, in fact, the colleagues uh, working on, on the roadmap for the, for the next decade to provide them with a consolidated uh, output uh, uh, that will feed, uh, hopefully, into the roadmap. So it, it is our collective opportunity here to collect some thoughts around the connection of these two important dots. And so help me, uh, and this is uh, my, my plea to everyone participating indeed, not only to the speaker, to, this, to respond to this overall question of what actions are needed in the roadmap for the implementation of the UNGPs in the next decade to accelerate the implementation of the SDGs. Um, and, and I very much invite again everyone to participate by commenting, uh, not only asking questions, or commenting real time through the, through the function. Uh, I think you can use both the Q&A and the chat uh, function. Do request to intervene because we have reserved uh, the last half an hour of these discussions for questions and, 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 and comments. Now, before I, I, I turn to the panelists, uh, I am conscious of the fact that many connected to these sessions today are probably experts already on the SDGs and all uh, uh, on the UN that in principles, perhaps many of you are experts on both. 
but there may be some that are expert only one of the subject matter or perhaps uh, are still um, learning the basics of each of the two uh, agenda and because uh, at least one of the objective of these forums is to raise awareness to speak to new people that are connecting with this uh, with this agenda of business and human rights i would like to uh, use the next three minutes uh, of our time to broaden the scope of our discussion to those who are new to these connections and i would like to do that uh, by sharing a very short video that we have prepared uh, specifically for the purposes of illustrating the basics of the connection between responsible business and sustainable development we will unpack that obviously during our discussion so if if uh, the, um, my colleague kevin can share the video we can start with that The Asia-Pacific region has long benefited from pro-growth policies, foreign investment and a strong labor force. Millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, but the gains have come at a cost, especially for human rights. In some countries, economic growth has been accompanied by significant human rights abuses by business operations. In the past, Responsibility for addressing human rights abuses by business operations has been the subject of fierce debates. All that changed in 2011 with the introduction of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights that were unanimously adopted by the Human Rights Council. The Guiding Principles provide a framework to address and improve human rights standards in the business sector. They define the state's duty to protect human rights in business operations, a business's responsibility to respect human rights, and for both to provide remedies for when violations occur. The guiding principles provide a way for businesses to contribute to the 2030 Agenda and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. For example, anti-discrimination policies at the workplace that boost gender equality and empower women in support of SDG 5. Monitoring and auditing of supply chains to eradicate forced labor. As a result, businesses create good work opportunities and support economic growth in support of SDG 8. As businesses set up grievance mechanisms and complaint systems to respect rights, they prevent disputes from turning into crisis and conflicts, contributing to SDG 16. UNDP is focused on promoting the UN's guiding principles by providing technical advice to governments, developing policies, due diligence processes and remedies for businesses, and supporting civil society organizations and human rights defenders to improve accountability. UNDP is strengthening both businesses and human rights to promote a sustainable future. All right, I'm sorry. I think we've had, we might have had some uh, uh, technical uh, difficulties in showing the video and uh, please accept my apologies for that. We may come back to the video uh, later. Uh, if, if uh, we have time, and, and I'm sorry for missing the opportunity to provide an overall uh, framework of connection between these, uh, these two uh, agendas. Uh, but I'm sure that the discussion with the panelists will most certainly anyway uh, flag uh, those, those connections. Um, let me uh, try to turn to the panelists, which I will introduce um, one by one as i will be posing the questions today there will be two rounds of questions the first question will be the same for everyone and the second round of questions will be a dedicated one given the specific uh, competence uh, or expertise of the panelists or indeed the organization they, they re represent so the first question is the same for everyone and again points to the connection between the two agenda Again, it's a simple question. So I would like to ask to each of you, what are the three things 
you would like to see in the roadmap for the implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in the next decade that will specifically further the achievement of the SDGs. I've been already in touch with all of you and I, and I encourage you uh, to not necessarily only point to the most obvious uh, connections. Uh, think, uh, help us also thinking a little bit outside the box beyond uh, the SDG 8, uh, 5 or, or, or SDG 10 uh, connections or 16. So indeed, do stress those SDGs if they are important to the message you want to convey, but help us also in thinking outside the box. The first uh, panelist that I would like uh, to ask to answer to this question is Elin Vronsky, uh, Department Director of Human Rights and Business at the Danish Institute for Human Rights. Uh, uh, Elin, you have the floor. Thank you, Livio, and, and thanks for hosting uh, this session. I think the, the video gave a, a pretty good overview of why uh, the two agendas are, are connected. And um, I'd like to maybe just do a little bit of a, a reminder that um, the analysis that, that we've done at the Danish Institute for Human Rights shows that um, over 92% of the uh, sustainable development goals and targets actually reflect human rights instruments. And in addition to that, there is a very explicit reference in the 2030 agenda to uh, not only uh, the fact that, that businesses need to step up to support the implementation of the SDGs, but also that businesses should do so in a responsible manner. So it's already embedded in the, in the 2030 agenda. Um, as I think your video showed uh, quite clearly, uh, and this is also our own analysis, is that the way for business to actually support the realization of the sustainable development goals is to conduct human rights due diligence. And therefore, my first point will be that in the context of the uh, UNGP's uh, test 10 plus, uh, looking at the 10 years ahead, um, I believe that uh, the um, spread of mandatory human rights due diligence, meaning making it obligatory for business enterprises to conduct human rights due diligence across their global value chains, will be a, a fundamental element of realization of the SDGs. Um, then I'd like to give three very quick uh, examples uh, of um, um, certain goals uh, and, and targets that maybe we don't look at uh, um, immediately when we think about uh, business and human rights and human rights due diligence. The first one is uh, around um, the uh, climate action and energy transition. We know that uh, if we want to realize the SDGs, one of the priority areas is to address uh, climate change. Uh, we also know that a very large portion of uh, carbon emissions is linked to energy. So we, we, you know, we all agree that we need to do something to change uh, our energy consumption from fossil fuels to cleaner forms of energy. But what we are seeing at the moment is that you know, lessons learned from the extractive industries, from um, uh, you know, other, other energy sectors, um, are not necessarily brought into the energy transition. Uh, we're seeing you know, conflicts with indigenous peoples around the use of land for wind farms. Um, there are a number of issues related to mining of rare minerals uh, that are uh, needed for solar panels. So uh, you know, that's the first uh, thing I'd like to, to point to. We really need to embed human rights due diligence in the energy transition to realize SDG 7 on, uh, on energy. The second example uh, that is also maybe a little bit overlooked is uh, the need for states uh, to step up uh, when they themselves are acting as a business or supporting businesses directly, uh, both in the uh, business and human rights agenda uh, and in the sustainable development goals, we don't focus too much on this. Uh, there has been a lot of focus on what businesses should do and a lot of focus on what states should do to regulate business. But not many people are speaking about the fact that public procurement represents a huge portion of our economy. That's 
states are also involved in public-private partnerships to realize you know, infrastructure projects, that states are supporting their businesses when they uh, invest abroad through uh, you know, um, export credit agencies or other types of things. So that will be my second point. Uh, uh, um, ensure that states uh, step up their efforts when they themselves have connections to, to businesses. And that will, of course, contribute to SDG 12 and responsible consumption, where there's also a specific target on public procurement and uh, SDG 11 and many more. And then my last example, which is, uh, you know, you invited us to think a little bit out of the box. So I'm going to just um, mention SDG 14 here, which is uh, around um, the sustainable use of, of ocean-based resources. What do human rights have to do with fish, you would ask me? Then I would say, you know, many things. And uh, we are actually overlooking the role of humans in uh, the ocean-based economies. We need to think about the rights of coastal communities, of indigenous peoples, of workers uh, in those economies to support the realization of SDG 14. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing my co-panelists here. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, super relevant example is exactly what I was hoping and uh, indeed expecting uh, from you. Uh, hearing about SDG 13, SDG 2, SDG 12, that's, that's really music to my ears in terms of the objective of, of this um, session. And indeed, thank, thank you for bringing up uh, mandatory human rights due diligence. I mean, I'm sure that this is a word that we'll hear over and over and over during this forum. We'll, we'll do a count on how, how many times we hear that word, uh, and which again, is not surprising. Let me turn to, uh, the second uh, panelist, uh, again, asking the same question. I would like to give the floor to Viraf Mehta, who is the Chief Executive of Partners in Change. So Viraf, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your question, Livio. And in terms of a brief contribution, I think, on what we've been asked. I think in the first instance, my experience with working on these issues shows that it's it's necessary not just to set, talk about human rights in business, but to take the next step and to talk, explain what a human rights based approach to, for example, all the SDGs actually entails. And this would obviously in, include explicit reference to human rights, non-discrimination in any form, focus on the vulnerable and marginalized and so forth. The, basic pillars of a human rights based approach. I say this because I think underlying the, the question is, is how well both the SDGs and the UNGPs complement or don't each other. And I compliment Ellen and the Danish Institute of Human Rights for their excellent work in the Human Rights Data Explorer in the paper on responsible business conduct at the cornerstone of the SDGs. I think on the ground here, speaking as somebody from South Asia, in my case, and in, from India, amongst, without going into too much of the conceptual flaws that we have, the lack of coherence, which I think will get further down the line in, in this session, but to say that the agenda of human rights is a human, right, a human rights based approach is critical to the achievement of the development agenda, uh, 2030 agenda, without which it can't be met. Then comes the role of business. So if the state is not consistent with a human rights-based approach to the issues at hand, continues to be, I think, misled in many, many nations by an ease of doing business uh, concept as opposed to uh, the agendas before us, the sustainable development and the business and human rights agenda. Amongst the things that, that I would like to see happening in the next decade, in the decade ahead of us, is that there will be a natural tendency for human rights and business agenda to move. And you'll hear this, I think, from Shuba and others in the panel. In terms of operational items, you may have a human rights policy, you may develop a HRDD, mm, methodology and process and so forth. 
But what we do see uh, with leadership business is the lack of that type of leadership in two ways. So what, the first thing that I, I would call for is that this agenda, the SDG agenda, of which human rights is, is, is the core and integrated pillar to achieve them, is on the board agenda of all companies, large or small, which means that not just a, a item on the agenda submitted for from a compliance point of view by the company secretary, but much more deeply. And this deepening is not just by putting it on the board. I think we have to really consider a transformation of the governance of companies, new types of board that give space and voice to stakeholders and their representatives or rights holders, if you prefer, and their representatives on the board and access to those discussions that set and review the company's performance in the responsible business conduct agenda of which um, uh, human rights is, is a, a, a absolute part. My, 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 not difference, but my caution in possibly pre, you know, presenting HRDD as a universal, not panacea, but as I think overstating the contribution that it makes is premature in the sense that in countries, if I had to take the words human rights due diligence, it's not even possible for me to translate in the vernacular in most parts of my country. And I would have to look at um, mechanisms that are appropriate to the small context of a business landscape that is not dominated by 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 listed companies, but by our small medium enterprise that come primarily in the informal sector. This push uh, towards actually taking the agenda and providing the sort of incentives, handholding over time is essential as large companies and corporations are forced to look through uh, legislation at their global value chains and their domestic ones. And I agree with previous speaker talking about the power of the state from the uh, point of view of its place in the marketplace. So I would urge public procurement systems, for example, to play uh, an intelligent role in incentivizing for those businesses that are serious about the agenda, have demonstrated, known and shown, uh, their responsibility to respect human rights. And equally, the financial sector and in the investor groups. A third point would be, I'm conscious of the time, a third point would be, I think we need ongoing campaigns. Uh, those who are fortunate to be able to say SDG and quote the numbers and read the UNGPs are, are a minority in our nations here. And to take the issue to the ground, for example, to even our middle class consuming population who have, I think, that SDG of responsible production consumption to imbibe into their practices, the types of education campaigns and the redressal systems required to get consumers on board in our countries beyond looking at just the sensitivities of cost and quality, but expanding the definition of quality to include human rights and environmental and climate change issues is an ongoing imperative, especially with the youth, right from school, university, management, education, young consumers, powerful campaigns that have made a difference in many nations, including ours. Uh, the last stage, if I may, just for 30 Please. Seconds, is that whilst we, we are in complete agreement with the conceptual aspect of doing no harm, i.e. respecting, we have to find bridges between the positive aspects of what companies do for human rights without any way compromising that this can be used to offset negative impacts, not at all. However, the dispensation in many of our nations here in South Asia with the terminology CSR, which actually represents the major majority of their thinking vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs has to be converted into a rights-based uh, paradigm very, very soon. And the, the ways in which uh, corporate disclosure are able in integrated reporting as it evolves to actually uh, present a more complete picture of what the company has done with its negative impacts on human rights and the environment, as well as its positive contributions, I think needs to be speeded up in ways that are easily accessible and readable. So let me pause there.
Thank you, Vera. You, you went slightly over time, but you are forgiven uh, because your contributions were, were um, a really uh, a first class contributions uh, to this discussion today. And I'm sure we'll come back to many of those. Uh, I hope the participants pick up on, on the points uh, that you have made. Uh, I certainly appreciated the fact that you placed these questions in the context uh, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of South Asia, of India more specifically, uh, and, and you brought in again the MHRDD and, and, and actually pointed to some of the challenges in bringing it in. It's just not as easy as translating it into these regions. Uh, the other word that I heard loud and clear is leadership, leadership from companies, leadership from governments. And I connect that to the point made earlier by Ellen on both of them signaling leadership, but at the same time uh, working, uh, um, working together. Lastly, campaigns, awareness raising. Uh, I have a soft spot for this issue. I do agree with you. It's probably going to remain probably the main action for the next decade. We'll come back to that, but um, let me give the floor to the third uh, panelist uh, today, Shuba Sekhar, Regional Director uh, of Human Rights uh, uh, for Eurasia and North Africa for the Coca-Cola company. Shuba, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Livio, and good afternoon from New Delhi. Uh, so, Livio, you 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 know this question is a very important uh, uh, aspect, even from from a practitioner's point of view. UNGPs and SDGs are the, uh, you know of the two sides of the same coin. They are very closely. Intellect, uh, interlinked and it makes perfect sense to have a common roadmap. So just on a, on a lighter way to explain the interconnectedness, let's say we have a very good initiative on, on, on SDG. Uh, and you know, in, the, in the same area, in the same supply chain, there is child labor. So it's a case of operation successful, but patient is dead because obviously your initiative you know, cannot be taken as successful. And similarly, if you're only looking at human rights and you know, let's say there's a child labor and you're throwing out the ch ch you know children without holistically addressing the drivers of child labor then you know it is a case of putting the children at greater risk so just to kind of explain you know how it works uh, on the ground so I'm, i picked up three areas where i feel should be part of the next decade for ungps and which also have a uh, you know inter interlinkage with the sdg uh, sdg agenda the first is importance of leveraging technology creatively and effectively as a means of accelerating UNGP implementation. So issues are huge, we know that, and COVID has exacerbated uh, the uh, problems and the risks. And it's only technology which will enable the ecosystem players to think big, scale fast, and provide cost-effective solutions to uh, these issues. And you know, we, we talk about global supply chains operating in a number of countries. And so, you know, this the cost effectiveness of technology is extremely important. Now, you know, we, uh, Ellen talked about you know importance of effective human rights due diligence. I couldn't agree more, and it needs to definitely be part of you know standard business practice uh, incorporated in various business operations and business decisions, but technology can you know, where it uh, comes in is, you know, technology can play a role in this due diligence as a tool to gather data continually. Uh, you know, th there is uh, auditing and other things in person, but that is at points of time. But here there is a, you know, continual data, which is extremely important in terms of, you know, understanding the risk, mapping supply chains horizontally and vertically, uh, gaining transparency, even for the company, you know, um, as we've spoken uh, earlier in, in a number of occasions, uh, you know, uh, global supply chain are not straight lines, they are like spaghetti. So even from a brand point of view, the relationship and visibility is tire one. But even, even as a brand, you know, the, uh, the, you know the, the brand does want to understand deeper and deeper. And so, uh, you know, even from a brand point of view, transparency is important. Then providing data and red flags. So, uh, and help in prioritization uh, of areas for capability building and remediation. Because, you know, issues are large, they are, you know, scattered all over in, you know, take 
make a case for global companies such as ours, 200 countries. So we need to prioritize and see where are the big issues, where are the red flags. And then apart from that, you know, uh, in the reporting requirements, which are becoming increasing. So an area where we see a huge potential is the modern slavery, which is, you know, where the manufacturing locations are the tip of the iceberg and the issue really pans multiple countries going deep down to the villages of the sending countries. Uh, now, uh, this will also play a role, very important role in the SDG, uh, you know, achievements in agriculture, healthcare, education. I think technology can play, uh, you know, a very important role and help accelerate the progress. And I also would just like to mention here that technology can't solve all problems. I'm not trying to say it is a panacea or a silver bullet, but it has solid potentials to fast track both UNGPs and uh, SDGs. The second is, um, what was meant, mentioned by, by Viraf on, you know, uh, the, the fact that UNGPs are applicable to all businesses ir irrespective of size. And now SMEs are uh, across the board, you know, this discussion keeps coming up as practitioners, you know, who've been trying to work in this area from 2006, 2007. We see, you know, we see the challenges and very unique challenges of uh, SMEs and uh, they, they lack capacity. There are so many other issues that they face. Yet, uh, you know, these SMEs are part of domestic supply chains, global supply chains, and there are a lot of risks there uh, which need to be addressed. Now, therefore, uh, you know, in the next decade roadmap, we need to have, you know, a focus, uh, you know, uh, focus on SME sector, providing them the requisite support, taking a collaborative approach with them. And this goes for all ecosystem players. Uh, and, um, you know, the, and the reason also I'm driving at SMEs, like Viraf had pointed out, is their importance as job creators, importance in poverty reduction. And therefore, you know, they also play a very important role in, uh, you know, in uh, SDGs, uh, and the way, principle that leaving no one behind uh, in the 2030 agenda because they also help, you know, the women and, uh, you know, uh, people in the rural areas to get uh, means of uh, livelihood. And even from an SDG point of view, there are multiple challenges, lack of, you know, access to finance, lack of capacity and knowledge, uh, and, you know, various skills. So definitely this needs to be looked into and addressed very hol holistically. The third that I would like to say is, you know, uh, while of course the salient human rights risks are there, every company is to work on it and absolutely important, but I think it is important to also look at the big drivers of these salient human rights risks. And if one takes one big driver and focused attention, it is poverty. Uh, and poverty, you know, the poverty, inequality, and vulnerability and risk nexus, which is a vicious cycle, needs to be addressed even more so now. You know, we've these issues were there, but COVID has brought in a huge impact. According to the World Bank, 1.4% uh, of the population will be pushed into extreme poverty, and almost half of them will be in South Asia region. So this, uh, you know, assumes a huge significance, uh, you know, for, for these countries. And here is where, you know, we need to pull in all the ecosystem players to address this in a multi-stakeholder, uh, you know, uh, as a multi-stakeholder approach. And uh, here again, no, no points for guesses. It will help accelerate the progress of uh, UNGPs and also the SDG agenda because it lies at the heart of several of the goals. So uh, with that, I'll end here. Thank you very much, Shuba. It's always, uh, I must say, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, in our forum. Uh, indeed, you've been in also many of, of my panels, and your points are, are always uh, uh, very inspiring. Uh, I take away uh, from, from the points that you had just made uh, the word poverty. Uh, so essentially SDG1, where all the, through your conversation with all the panelists, we are ticking uh, most of the boxes of the various SDGs. And I take away the reference to technology. Indeed, we have learned uh, during the last 12 months the difference that technology can make. <laughs> technology is making a huge difference in our forums. Technology is now making a huge difference in, in, in allowing us to manage the pandemic in many ways. Certainly, it will have to be uh, used uh, massively during the next decade. It can indeed make a difference. Thank you for highlighting some caveats to that. It's certainly not a silver bullet. It is linked to um, also some. It has also some some limits uh, when when not everyone is access to technology. But it is certainly uh, an instrument that the next decade will have to leverage more 
both for the reach of the SDGs and the UNGPs. Let me turn uh, to uh, our four panelists today um, and welcome uh, Priyanka Hetiarachachi, uh, country representative uh, in Sri Lanka of the Westminster uh, Foundation for Democracy. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I, I, I wrongly pronounced your name and I apologize for that, Priyanka, but thank you for being with us and we'll, I look forward uh, uh, to your uh, comments on the same questions. Over to you, Priyanka. Good morning, good afternoon, Livio and others, and thanks once again uh, for arranging a gathering like this. Um, so I will make uh, three interventions. Uh, won't surprise you to be the fourth speaker that comments on human rights due diligence, uh, but perhaps I'll make a very uh, conceptual point about why this is a key that, uh, a very powerful and sophisticated key that unlocks uh, coherence, alignment, and connections between the UNGPs and the SDGs. And because the HRDD system is already 10 years uh, that's been going on and being mainstreamed, it is a very relevant and powerful key that can be used. Um, and it is in this way, undertaking human rights due diligence requires you to focus on the context in each country, the political, economic development context, already you are in SDG territory. Secondly, uh, a business focuses on risks and impacts. Uh, they look at the leverage they have across supply chains. And critically, the HRDD system requires you to identify the opportunities to support the SDGs. So I think there is something within the HRDD system that allows a bridge between the do no harm focus of the UNGPs and the do more good focus of the SDGs. It also allows us uh, ability to move between the idea of respecting human rights and to fulfill and protect human rights. Uh, and I think that in, in that context, it's wonderful to see the economic case, the business case being made to quantify delivery of the SDGs. And I've seen an analysis done uh, for Asia across four SDGs on food, energy, health, cities, uh, by a multi-sector group and a cross-national group. And uh, just to highlight some of the market opportunities uh, in job creation, the potential to create some 230 million jobs in value creation and estimation of US 5 trillion, uh, reducing the costs of inequalities and so on. And this kind of business case, uh, and with some level of sophistication, I think helps. But uh, HRDD is a powerful uh, map or tool to get there. Um, the second intervention I would like to make is, again, a mainstreaming one. And this time, I'm going to pick uh, CSO engagement and the idea of mainstreaming, the civil society organization mainstreaming. Why? Uh, well, the UNGPs see CSO participation essential, so that's an essential part of it, uh, whether for human rights due diligence work, whether for reporting work, whether for multi-stakeholder processes. CSO engagement is also an important part of SDGs. Uh, almost every area of the SDGs will have uh, expert, experienced, knowledgeable CSOs uh, who will work in that area. Uh, and CSOs play a constructive role in relation to business and government's human rights and SDGs footprint. Uh, they play a valuable role in terms of accountability and monitoring. So I think drawing on the significant expertise and experience and knowledge of CSOs and mainstreaming that uh, over the next 10 years would be valuable. Uh, it's a process that's begun. And I guess it's a, uh, it, there are opportunities here to normalize this and see this is a very usual way in which uh, to operate. Um, I suppose my third intervention is perhaps a slightly wildcard one, but I think, again, it illustrates um, some very interesting insights about the UNGPs and the SDGs. And this one is focused on state-owned enterprises. Uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar with that language, uh, that's usually a legal entity created by governments to undertake commercial activities. Uh, they come in different shapes and sizes, and we see them in different parts of the world. Uh, we see them deliver a range of uh, commercial activities across food, water, energy, telecommunications, 
And so they're powerful, influential, they represent some 20% across the Fortune Global 500. Uh, they can be a role model. Now, here is the thing, the UNGP specifically addresses them uh, and requires them to do more. The UN Working Group has done some deep thinking on uh, what uh, the role of SOEs under the UNGPs are. Uh, there's a 2016 report and things they built up on that. The OECD has turned its mind to it. Um, and, and then the link with the SDGs being, these are areas in which so many SOEs work. Uh, they require the state to give serious consideration to the SDGs. And so there could be opportunities here for the work done on reconciling some of the unresolved um, and difficult challenges when you have state duties and private sector, private type responsibilities, but also an opportunity for leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, my, my gratitude goes to you, uh, Priyanka, again. Uh, I think we, we are consolidating a great mapping of opportunities, of ideas, uh, which certainly the, the, the team working on the roadmap will, will really appreciate. Some of the things mentioned uh, uh, may sound as obvious, some others are definitely not. Uh, one thing that it may sound obvious but is not is your reference to the role of civil society. In fact, I had pointed out in the previous interventions that Ada had mentioned the need for leadership from the government, the need for leadership from businesses, absolutely relevant. We have not heard of civil society uh, yet. So I thank you for bringing that up as, a, as an absolutely critical element. Obviously, we'll have to put that into the context uh, of South Asia and broader Asia and perhaps globally of shrinking civil space. So I would add to your point, the fact that the roadmap needs to find ways to empower more civil society, but also find way to do that in an environment where their space is shrinking. So maybe here, the recommendation is also for the governments. Uh, again, many other points are very relevant. In, indeed, including uh, state-owned enterprises, I think there was already a question on that. We may come back to that uh, later when it comes to countries leading uh, by example. Let me, uh, we are slightly uh, uh, behind schedule, so let me quickly move to the um, fifth panelist and introduce uh, Betty Yolanda, who is the Asia Regional Manager for the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, that precious instrument uh, most of us use uh, 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 on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. So thank you to the Business and Human Rights Center for the great work you do, and the word uh, is yours, Betty. Thank you, Livio. It's, it's very difficult to be the fifth speaker when <laughs> the key issues have been shared by other speakers. Uh, so uh, the three issues, the three things that I would like to see in the roadmap for the, the implementations of the UNGPs in the next decade, quite similar to what uh, has been shared by the previous speakers, but I just wanted to uh, you know, emphasize and also reiterate the importance, for example, on human rights due diligence and also the importance of involving civil society. So the first thing that I would like to share is, um, you know, um, the next in the next decade, I think the UNGPs need to look at the investments of environmental and human rights due diligence as a core element of SDGs realization. Um, respect for human rights is not just a matter of compliance, but instead requires capacity building, collaborations, and leadership. As, as Priyanga said, you know, business should go beyond the do, not, do, not, do no harm approach and take a more proactive role to drive positive change for society. And also, as has been shared by Ellen, you know, environmental and human rights due diligence should include full value change connected to a company's operations, products, or service. So with this approach, we will be able to capture the full spectrum of sustainability issues from, you know, labor rights and decent work to communities' rights throughout the uh, full value change, which will then create a level playing field. And transforming uh, business models to provide decent work and a living wage in their operations and value change will also help realize the sustainable development goals, particularly goal eight. A corporate actions to ensure a living wage, for example, is a critical driver of the realizations of other targets, for example, targets related to ch children's rights. 
Um, and then the second thing is, I don't think other speakers have, you know, had touched on, on this issue is about strengthening uh, access to remedy. So pillar, th pillar three of the UNGPs, uh, you know, clarify state duty and business responsibility to facilitate access of, uh, to effective remedies for allegations of business related human rights abuse. So failing to address uh, adverse human rights impacts of business activities will potentially undermine the realizations of the SDGs. States are required to ensure effective access to remedy and to take steps to ensure the effectiveness of state-based judicial and non-judicial mechanism. In this regard, I think the implementations of SDG 16 must include concrete measures for improving access to remedy for victims, including by ensuring the existence of a Paris principle compliant national human rights institution. If, if we look at the, you know, the national human rights institutions in South Asia, you know, three of uh, you know, the four national human rights institutions obtain uh, A status and also one uh, got a B status. So we need to you know, reflect on the effectiveness of these national human rights in institutions in providing effective access to remedy. In you know, the 2010 Edinburgh uh, Declaration, for example, envisions the participations of national human rights institutions as either direct or indirect. If, you, if we look at the mandate of national human rights institutions, not all human rights institutions have the mandate to, uh, you know, to receive complaints and to take actions on, on com complaints uh, of you know, allegations of human rights abuse. So I think it's very crucial to ensure the direct participations of national human rights institutions in pushing for effective access to remedy. And, and again, uh, when we're talking about SDG 16, uh, you know, we are seeing that SDG 16 has been narrowly viewed by businesses. Their attentions has been focused on, you know, combating corruptions or eliminating adverse corporate behaviors, which has limited their, you know, potential role in making progress on SDG 16. So uh, I think businesses are well positioned to hear their influence to advocate for justice, for example, which is a core element of peace. So this, uh, this morning, we also heard about how civic, uh, you know, civic space is shrinking in South Asia and in other parts of the world, and also how human rights defenders are being targeted. I think in this regard, another important contribution that businesses can make is to ensure a safe and enabling environment for human rights defenders. And then the last point that I would like to make is again just emphasizing on what has, you know, what Priyanka has mentioned about you know recognitions of key role of civil society. If we want to link this to SDGs, we can see SDG 17, which calls for you know multi-stakeholders uh, partnership between government, businesses, civil society, the UN, and other actors to mobilize and share knowledge, expertise, and other resources in support of the SDGs realizations. I think we need to emphasize that an assertive civil society is needed to help expose business-related human rights abuse and to propose reform to, to governments. And, and I know that the UNGPs uh, you know, have uh, you know, highlighted the important role of, of civil society, but it should continue highlighting civil society valuable efforts to hold governments and companies accountable for their respective duties and responsibilities under the UNGPs. Uh, you know, if we, if we go back to the commentary of the Guiding Principle 18, for example, it states that uh, human rights defenders, among other members of civil society, are valuable sources of information when engaging in due diligence to assess actual or potential human rights impacts of business activities. Uh, so that's all for me, thank you. Thank you, uh, Beth. That's all, and uh, that's uh, really a lot. I, I, we heard uh, again a plea for being ambitious uh, in the roadmap and and uh, uh, setting goals for pr uh, protection and uh, promotion, indeed, of, this, uh, of human rights by business, not only. Um, avoiding doing harm uh, and thank you also for sort of turning a little bit of the paradigm in, in your intervention and, and pointing to actually something that the 2030 agenda can do for a UNGP agenda uh, instead of the other way around which is what most of the other panelists had chosen to do when you pointed out the importance of giving more 
space for remedies. Uh, that will uh, definitely uh, uh, increase the implementation of SDG 16 and, and be of, of uh, uh, critical value for the UNGP's agenda, certainly both uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, capacitating and empowering more national human rights institutions and indeed human rights defenders. I see that some of some good questions are already coming and I encourage participants to ask more. I am determined to find space for those. So I, I really appeal to the panelists to stick uh, within the minutes allocated to them, perhaps even a bit shorter if possible. But let me turn to this, the, the, the last panelist for this round of question and welcome Mr. Farouk Ahmed, Secretary General of the Bangladesh Employers Federation. Mr. Farouk, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Livio. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished participants, ladies, gentlemen, uh, panelists. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my thanks uh, to, uh, to the organizers and also IUE and ACTEM for inviting me to join this particular uh, important discussion. Uh, before I go into the actual event, I would like to, with your consent, would like to switch off my camera so that uh, I have a stable uh, connectivity. Please do, please do. Thank you. <clears throat> well, before going into the three specific issues, I would like to uh, highlight a little bit as to why connecting business and human rights uh, with SDGs are important. Any business needs to have an inbuilt mechanism to secure its course towards more pro-people oriented production and manufacturing process. This was the motivation behind the United Nations Human Rights Council's endorsement of the guiding principles for business and human rights back in 2011. If you look at the SDGs closely, these are goals, no doubt, but their roots can be traced back to basic human rights. Pursuing SDGs will also lead to ensuring human rights to a great extent. Achieving the goals would mean that no one goes hungry or lives a life in poverty. It would also mean an improved health, education, allowing individuals, societies, and ultimately whole communities to grow in a decent uh, environment. All these are basically human rights, but are well covered in various goals, maybe one, two, three, four, or even SDG eight. So that the profit motive in businesses should not blind us so much that we disregard human rights and fundamentals of life and livelihood. Businesses and human rights and SDGs, along with various other factors, act as cocks to the large wheel of progression. That is why the, it is essential that we connect the uh, these two together. Now going down to the specific uh, three, three areas where one must make emphasis in while uh, preparing the roadmap, uh, I would be very, very uh, practical and from the ground reality perspective and out of the panelists as I find, uh, possibly I am, I am uh, one which deeply involved uh, with the business and business organization. First and foremost criteria or, or action that to be undertaken in the roadmap is the awareness building. If we just take a survey, which uh, at times we had uh, in an informal manner, particularly in our region, you know, South Asia is a very diverse region uh, and with a large number of population, almost one third of the global population, uh, they live in South Asia. 50% or more people, common people, even do not know what does it stand for SDG. I can tell you this much. You can have a uh, official survey on that. So it is essential to let people know, starting from top echelon policymakers to the common citizens of each and every country, the benefits of the SDGs. Uh, it has to be a massive campaign the responsible and privileged segment of the society must come forward in their total approach to make common people aware of the universal benefits of the SDGs. 
we have to believe that our surroundings, if at peace and comfortable state, we do remain at peace and comfortable state too. In today's world, it's an integrated world. So is, the, so is today's society. Therefore, we must engage ourselves in our individual as well as institutional capacity to carry forward the baton of SDGs to our next generation and a massive awareness campaign. Like if we remember a couple of years back, we had, uh, we had massive campaign against HIV AIDS. Similarly, now we have a campaign in using mask for uh, uh, getting less infected uh, because of the COVID. So similar to, sort of awareness program uh, should be uh, 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 taken into consideration. Next is the uh, uh, reward and recognition. We, we are doing many things at enterprise level which uh, commensurate with the uh, with the fulfillment of many of the goals, but we do not know. Uh, uh, there should be proper system of identifying the SDG champions and reward them in the right manner so that people get inspired by seeing those champions uh, and uh, uh, can, uh, can uh, take similar uh, step. And the last point that I will uh, mention is the education and skills development. Though there is a specific SDG goal for quality education, but I would bring here a total society approach in terms of education and skills development. There is no alternative to, our edu uh, to education for our next generation and develop market demand oriented skills that is needed to create an environment for a decent employment. So uh, these are the three issues that, that I will uh, highlight so that uh, people can take uh, uh, action and include them uh, uh, in, the, in the roadmap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Farooq. Uh, spot on to the point and, and uh, excellent uh, contribution indeed to our discussion uh, today. Um, I hear the word again, campaign. I think I, I, we've heard it already three times. And, and again, I couldn't agree more. Now is the time, we, 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 the UNGPs have been implemented for 10 years already, but the gaps of knowledge uh, are still huge. The next decade will indeed be uh, again a decade uh, in need of raising awareness and campaign is the, the word that, that I like. We need to look at the power of mobilization, mobilizing people um, exactly to say as this was done previously in the HIV campaign or in the environmental campaign on climate change. That is absolutely the way to go. We have heard it already in many of the reflections on the next decade. So you are just reaffirming a point which is extremely uh, valid. Um, we have a little bit more than half an hour uh, left. I do want you to come back to some of the questions that were posed. So let me try to do it this way. As I start the second round of questions for each of you, let me first pose at least one of the questions that come from the floor and invite you to try to address this question also, uh, as you are making uh, uh, your next point. And, and, and the question that was posed, which I think is very relevant, uh, and this speaks to the points that you already made in the first round, is about the role of youth. After all, we're looking uh, ahead, we're looking at the next decade, we're looking at the future. We haven't heard the word youth yet. And uh, now actually Mr. Farouk mentioned it when he, when he came to, mobilize, to, to um, um, campaign and mobilization. So I invite you all to try to respond to these questions that came from the floor when uh, answering to the second round of questions, which I will uh, move to uh, right away in the interest of time. For this second round of questions, I would like to start, uh, in fact, with, uh, with uh, Priyanka, uh, just uh, um, uh, starting with you then. So uh, Priyanka, we, we heard already um, about the concept of leaving no one behind. It was mentioned by one of the other panelists. Uh, and that is indeed a key promise of the 2030 agenda. Uh, again, to leave no one behind. And the actors in charge of implementing the SDG which include uh, the business sector, are actually asked to focus first and foremost on those left most behind. Now, what does this mean in terms of responsible business practices? What does uh, leaving no one behind really means or should mean 
for companies. The floor is yours. Again, please, please, please keep it to five minutes, even better if four minutes, so that we can leave space for other questions. Priyanka, the floor is yours again. I hope that Priyanka heard my question and uh, is online. Uh, I, I think he is not online. He is not online at the moment. Uh, so let me let me uh, let me move to uh, uh, Ellen as a second panelist. We'll come back to Priyanka with the question on the leaving no one uh, behind. So Ellen, uh, I'd like to build on on the answer on the answer uh, that you had given to the first question, essentially. And uh, you mentioned that the, the initiative for human rights contributed to the discussion around the connection between the SDGs and business human rights with, with two products, one of which was even referenced by VIRAF, actually. Uh, one is your discussion paper on responsible business conduct as a cornerstone of the 2030 agenda. And then uh, another instrument which I personally find uh, very interesting and inspiring, and it's an online database that captures tens uh, of, of good practices uh, divided per salient human rights issue of companies that are further in the reach of specific SDG targets. So um, I have asked you already, and I hope you selected some of those most uh, inspiring uh, examples uh, to bring into this discussion today. Floor is yours, Celine. Thank you. And, and allow me to uh, try to share my screen for a, a second. Um, so just to, there you go. All right. So I'll, I'll be very, very short, um, but I wanted to um, highlight, uh, as, you, as you said, Livio, we have this little, little database that uh, aims at inspiring uh, mostly companies uh, on, on what they can do to realize the SDGs. And we showcase a number of examples uh, on, on these different areas. So you can go in and, and search, you know, uh, uh, issues that might be particularly relevant for, for your region. I'm thinking here, for example, around, you know, labor rights issues, land rights, gender discrimination, et cetera. And I, I just wanted to focus on maybe two um, areas that I hope could, could inspire um, uh, the, the audience. The, the first one is um, on uh, how uh, businesses uh, need to to speak out or speak up uh, in in um, preservation of the civic space and and the rule of law. And uh, ma many uh, of of the previous speakers have uh, already. Uh, talked about the importance of a well-functioning um, uh, society where you have uh, civil society actors, where you have well-functioning institutions, where you have national human rights institutions that also monitor uh, how uh, human rights are being respected in, in that uh, particular uh, state. Um, and we have seen in, in, in uh, recent uh, years, how in many places, you know, and not only I'm in- I'm sorry in to interrupt you, Ellen, just to say that your, your screen is not visible uh, to the participants. Uh, so I, maybe you might want to try that again uh, uh, and, and uh, to illustrate the points that you are making. Thank you. All right, is it working now? It, it is working indeed right now. Please go okay, ahead. Okay, great. Um, so, so I was just saying that, you know, we, we have seen in, in recent year a, you know, what, what you refer to as a shrinking space, Livio, and, and that's the case in, in, in many places uh, at the global level. Uh, and with uh, the, the pandemic uh, in certain um, areas of the world, uh, states have also taken, uh, you know, this opportunity of, of, of uh, uh, for restricting fundamental freedoms. Um, but I wanted to share a few examples here of um, what I think could be labeled as, you know, good practices by business of actually um, saying loud that having well-functioning institutions 
having freedom of expression, having freedom of assembly is actually also uh, something that businesses uh, value because they are also important to doing good business. So one very recent example is this statement uh, by uh, hundreds now of companies expressing concern uh, over the military coup in uh, Myanmar and the consequences of that. Um, and where, you know, both multinational enterprises operating in the country, but also local uh, businesses uh, signed on to, to a statement uh, uh, expressing how concerned they are about um, cramping down on, on rule of law. So I think that's an, an interesting example. And obviously that is uh, directly connected to SDG 16. Um, then um, the second example uh, that is highlighted here is uh, this uh, business network on civic freedoms and human rights defenders uh, that put out a, a statement um, highlighting how important they value um, the, the civic space, but also the role of, of human rights defenders. And there, I think, um, uh, to, to respond also to your question on use, uh, I think, you know, we need to have vibrant civil society uh, to be able to realize the SDGs, to push states, to push companies in the right direction, to highlight where the problems are. And if there is no space for use to express itself, then um, you know, we're going to have a, a big problem in, in realizing the, the sustainable development goals. Um, I want to highlight a, a second area. Um, if I manage to get to the next slide, yes, here you are, uh, which has also been uh, mentioned, I think, by, uh, by Betty as, as a key area. Um, and, um, you know, as businesses do their human rights due diligence, they often see down their supply chains that there are a number of issues related to labor rights um, in, in suppliers, sub-suppliers, subcontractors, etc. But very few businesses actually take steps to commit to a living wage. And the reason why I think this is really important is that if you think about why people are working um, you know, so many hours a week as they do in, in many countries in your region, maybe it is because otherwise they cannot uh, afford a decent living. So it means that in order to be able to feed their children, to have a roof uh, on their heads, and uh, other elements of what constitute, you know, the right to an adequate standard of living, people are working excessive overtime to a level that is actually contrary to, uh, you know, our, our fundamental rights at work. Um, and uh, many uh, of uh, the, the multinationals, they do a lot of social auditing, they see the issues but very few are actually then looking at the issue of wages because a lot uh, lies, I, I believe, in, in this issue. And um, I just wanted to highlight here uh, an example very recent. Please wrap up after this, Ellen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, where Unilever committed to, um, you know, a, a, a living wage or income throughout uh, their supply chain. And this obviously is, is directly connected to, of course, SDG 8, but also SDG 1 on, on, on no poverty, SDG on zero hunger, reducing inequalities, etc. And there are a few examples on, on that database that I invite you to, to be looking at. There's many more, uh, but I'll stop here and look forward to engaging with the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen, uh, and uh, forgive me if I don't comment specifically on the points you made, which are uh, uh, too many uh, even to comment. I do uh, uh, um, encourage participants, and perhaps you can share the link here on the chat to go on your, on your very well done uh, website. We are very rich of examples. Um, I'd like to now turn to uh, Betty for, for, the, for the next question, uh, which we'll, we'll go back a little bit to the COVID-19 pandemic. It hasn't come up a lot, but I, I think it does have an impact on the SDGs, so um, uh, it deserves a, a point to be made. So, Betty, 
even before the COVID-19 pandemic, not even one country was on track to achieve the SDGs. And the health crisis of the last uh, 12, 13 months uh, pushed additional people into poverty. We have, we have heard it today. Uh, and, and many of the progress made was offset by, by the pandemic. The Bizio Mares Resource Center, we know, has done a lot of work to study the response, the response of companies to the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'd like you to spend the next uh, three, four minutes, so hopefully please stay uh, 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 no more than four minutes on what are some of the realistic expectations. And I stress realistic expectations that we can set for the business sector in South Asia to contribute, to contribute in uh, building back forward. We haven't heard that, that uh, expression uh, much today, uh, so the floor is yours, Betty. Uh, thank you, Livia. But maybe uh, I will start with uh, sharing some key findings of, of you know, different reports or research that we have done with regard to uh, you know, businesses' response to COVID-19. So uh, in, in this regard, I would like to focus on the research that we have done uh, in the apparel sector. So uh, what we have found is that many fashion brands have policies and global frameworks agreements that explicitly protect fundamental freedoms in their supply chain. However, we also found a widespread of pattern of dismissal of unionized workers, which reveals the stark gap between policy commitments of uh, you know, companies with the realities that is you know, being lived by workers in their supply chain. Uh, you know, from the different research that we have done, uh, you know, we found that, uh, you know, fashion industry continue to use their business as usual approach and failed to respond to the suffering of the, you know, the workers experience during the pandemic. Uh, you know, one clear example in our report on union busting and uh, unfair dismissal against garment workers during COVID-19, we found how garment factories supplying to major fashion brands are using COVID-19 as a cover to crack down on trade unions. Actually, this finding confirms the different reports from workers' organizations, from media that shows that, you know, lays off disproportionately target unionized workers, suggesting that factories are using the pandemic as a cover to attack workers' freedom of association. And, and in one of our reports, we actually uh, highlighted four case studies that came from India and Bangladesh, where we found that 1,200 garment workers uh, at a unionized factory in India were sacked. And you know, about 3,000 workers were sacked at three factories in Bangladesh due to their union activism. So with regard to uh, you know, branch responses, particularly uh, you know, uh, to reported cases of union busting, we found that there's a lack of engagement by brands on reported cases of union busting. Uh, and also this suggests a lack of responsibilities being taken for abuses of freedom of associations and collective bargaining in their supply chain. And then the second uh, finding is brands acknowledge that uh, in some cases, uh, you know, that there are cases against, uh, you know, unionized workers and they took actions, but there is limited transparency and accountability on how, you know, the remedies uh, and also the outcomes of the remedies. And then uh, we also saw that there is a gap between company commitment to freedom of associations and implementation in factories, as I mentioned earlier. And we also saw local, you know, local labor laws uh, fall short of international standards. And in situations where labor laws and their enforcements are weak, companies tend not to you know, respect the higher international standards. Uh, and and when, you know, when we're talking about what are the realistic expectations that we can set for business sector in South Asia, I think we should focus on three things. So the first one is, Business should conduct human rights and labor rights due diligence, which should ensure that human rights due diligence processes and policies must, must cover all internationally recognized fundamental human rights. This includes, among others, you know, payment of a living wage as a basic right, as well as uh, you know, the importance of enabling right, for example, freedom of associations and collective bargaining. And we need to see a shift in buying practices to ensure that fair labor costs are guaranteed 
And also this actually, the guarantee of uh, you know, fair labor costs can also mitigate salient risks of systematic human rights abuse in the supply chain. And then we, we also need to see due diligence from you know, the right to form and or join a trade union. And then the second, uh, you know, uh, realistic expectation, uh, you know, for business is for business to actively engage workers and trade unions as parties on decisions regarding workers at the earliest possible, uh, including through, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, making sure that joint decisions should be made wherever possible. And then the third thing is businesses should actively promote freedom of association by prohibiting the, the discriminations against unionized workers. So I think those are the three realistic expectations that we can uh, you know, uh, you know, put forward to business sector in South Asia, Livia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yolanda, especially for focusing on a realistic uh, recommendations. We have three more speakers left. So again, in the interest of time and to make sure we respond also to questions posed uh, from the floor, let me just feed the two, one comment and one question to the next three panelists so that they can try as much as possible to also um, uh, answer those questions. So the first is a comment, actually someone disagreeing on the, the need uh, for, for campaign uh, and, and perhaps for a campaign on SDGs and UNGPs to go back to um, more commonly known values um, as justice, equality, and so on and so on. Again, if the, two, the next panelists feel like commenting on, on this, please do uh, so. And then there is another comment and question that uh, asks about uh, focus on refugee and, and migrants. Uh, again, if the panelists feel like um, uh, addressing these issues in their questions, that would be welcome. Uh, the next panelist that I would like to ask uh, to take the floor is, uh, is Viraf. So Viraf, I'd like to discuss with you uh, the progress or lack of thereof uh, in, in South Asia, of course, when it comes to policy coherence, right? Most uh, countries in South Asia have plans on the on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. All of them are uh, reported on, 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 on BNR's uh, voluntary national uh, reports. Many of them are indeed doing national action plans on business and human rights, but we see these policy uh, efforts not really talking to each other. Uh, or not talking to each other enough. Um, so I would like you to uh, talk a little bit about your views on how we can make sure, again, the next decade, that these two policy efforts uh, talk to each other. What hasn't worked and how can we make it work better? Over to you and please stick to four minutes if you may. Thanks. Libya, thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. I think just addressing the question immediately, Certainly the policy coherence, what are the elements? I think it's more than policy coherence. We need the right type of enabling environment for human rights and you know, activist friends of mine working on human rights and human rights and business have reminded me that India, for example, would do well to have a national action plan on human rights prior to a national action plan on business and human rights. And we see that if you look at the last decade, I think in the policy front, we still have, whilst you may have a nodal agency, a Ministry of Corporate Affairs that is um, anchoring a national action plan uh, uh, process in India, you have competing ministries with very different mandates who um, uh, we don't have consensus, we don't have a human rights ministry. I think that in this type of scenario, the policy segments, as other speakers have pointed out, not only to do with access to remedy, we, we have to find ways to enable further our national human rights institutions, in our case in India, the NHRC, to play a much more, uh, much more meaningful role with the business human rights agenda. At another level, we have, we have obviously the 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 need for civil society actors to have and human rights defenders to have the freedom and the enabling environment in which to protest and to raise concerns and just in terms of 
you know, the access to remedy, I think it's an important thing that to remind ourselves that I agree with Betty. A number of state governments in the country at the time of COVID, along with less than scrupulous business, had maybe in nexus diluted certain labor laws. But the Supreme Court, let's be very clear about this, have ruled on, on when they were approached with these issues as these being unconstitutional and COVID-19 not being a sufficient emergency to justify dilution of basic labor laws and international human laws that India is signatory to. So at one level, I, I do think in a country like ours and in many South Asian countries, our, our courts have to, have to continue to play the, the role of defending uh, human rights at the level where we've seen the pandemic trying to cross uh, certain barriers and take those into its powers to amend, for example, Factories Act and other overtime freedom of association collective bargaining that you mentioned. But the Supreme Court has ruled that this is unconstitutional, opening up the real possibility of redress and challenge of what is patently goes against. So these are the real battles that are being fought in the country. Overall, I, I want to conclude by, I, I think, the biggest challenge of all that we really face, and I, I, I do, I am hopeful that this will be overcome. There continues to be a sort of false presumption that everything that we are talking about, business and human rights agenda, doesn't fit into mantras that we have in our country, like make in India, where I would add responsibly, or ease of doing business, and I would add sustainably to that they are still polarized as one or the other. So I think that this is where business itself has to speak out and say this is not so because that is the voice that government listened to. Ease of doing business, whether for foreign investors here, whether for multinational companies in India or for our own domestic uh, investments, have to start articulating that it's not an ease of doing business and making it easier at the price of human rights or environment, but in fact, um, ending on this, that as Farouk has pointed out, the fate of the SDGs are dependent on our region. India, China, South Asia doesn't meet the SDGs, the world won't meet the SDGs. And business have a huge role to play. So I think coming back again to something that Shubha and others have pointed out, the role of business leadership has to be resurrected where they are seen to be trans in sync with civil society demands and labor articulating and making commitments. This is a time for that type of action. And I'm still hopeful that young India at an average age of 28 and 29, another question that pointed out, are going to seek demands for these sort of uh, topics to be right up front in the next two, three years. COVID has woken up many sleeping giants and many sleeping presumptions, and the game is by far over. So everyone, this is the right time. This is the 10th year of the UNGPs. This timing is right. And I hope after this conference, there will be um, many, many positive actions that we can celebrate. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Vera, for a great point on the false presum presumptions. To me, that speaks again to to campaigning, if I can use again the word, it speaks again to advocacy from uh, leaders of business and indeed uh, from youth. Um, I'd comment a lot more if I had time, but uh, let, let me go to um, Shuba uh, and, and ask her uh, again on the issue of policy coherence. This is a challenge uh, for the states, as, as Vera just mentioned, but somehow also for companies. And most multinational enterprise, uh, uh, multinational enterprises, I'm sorry, have expressed uh, uh, specific commitments on both SDGs and and, and on human rights. Uh, Coca-Cola is one of those that has been very visible on both. But not all companies have aligned their action on SDGs and and human rights. So I would like you to talk a little bit uh, uh, about uh, you as the as the lead of human rights of Coca-Cola about the challenges in in um, uh, aligning these uh, two objectives that most of many companies have and perhaps you can give us some examples of how at the field level if possible in South Asia the objectives of these commitments are being pursued 
in integrated manner? I realize it's a long question for only three minutes, but I, I know you as a great speaker and I know uh, you concisely uh, give us a great feedback to that. Shuba, uh, floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you, Livio. I'll, I'll try and be as precise as possible. So basically everything flows from the company's purpose document. And I'm just going to kind of, you know, tell you a few words. It talks about sustainability. It talks about doing right thing and uh, it talks about ethical sourcing. So the, this is how it integrates the SDG and the UNGP. So now looking at how this translates into action and that too in South Asia, I'll take an example of India and I'll give you two examples. The first is, you know, the, the word without waste is a framework which is one of our top uh, global sustainability priorities which was launched in 2018 and this kind of looks at using our leadership to be part of the solution to the plastic waste problem and to build a more sustainable future for our planet by promoting recycling and reducing our PT footprint and it's it's got three buckets design collect partner and it's got uh, you know global targets which I would encourage people you know I, I'm not going into it for want of time but it's available on our website, www.cocacola.com. Now, you know, under this framework in India, we launched Project Prithvi uh, with UNDP India in 2018. And uh, this whole... Uh, effort is to develop a sustainable model of plastic waste management in India. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the beauty of this model is, of course, you know, the waste uh, part of it is uh, looked into, but also looking at the human, uh, you know, issues in the waste value chain. Uh, and this is in, you know, presently operational in 36, uh, 36 cities. And, uh, you know, so we, we know uh, people in India know how uh, this whole sector has got a lot of issues. It's fraught with informality. There is poor socio economic condition of waste pickers, presence of large women workers, unsafe working conditions. So a component of it uh, was also how do you, you know, kind of do the socio-economic upliftment of the rack pickers through a sustainable source of livelihood, enhanced in income through removal of middlemen. There's a lot of middlemen between the, the rack paper pickers and, you know, uh, uh, you know, other, other layers. Uh, then empowering the women recyclers by providing us, you know, a, a adequate standard of living, providing, you know, think basic amenities like PPE, personal protective equipment, safe drinking water, toilets, you know, focus on work environment, providing social security and also helping them leverage, you know, some of the government uh, uh, you know, uh, projects. So that way, looking at SDGs, uh, you know, we know like, uh, you know, the ones that are covered is uh, you know, 12, responsible consumption, 14, SDG 3, and also the UNGPs. The second example I'd like to give very briefly is our agriculture, uh, where it's, you know, we have a holistic, multi-pronged approach. And again, India, uh, our salient human rights risks, uh, you know, he helped us focus our efforts on the sugar supply chain, because we see that there, you know, there are issues issues, especially in a country like India. So we've done human rights due diligence in our 20 top sourcing countries, sugar sourcing countries, India being one of them, the report is on our website. And, uh, you know, apart from that, of course, this is a third party due diligence. We also have a specific policy called the Sustainable Agriculture Guiding Principles, which addresses issues in the agri, uh, you know, agri sourcing and with agri suppliers. And this has environment component, the human rights component and the management systems. In addition, we also kind of work with our, you know, our uh, sugar mill. So, you know, there is a, a Mita Sona initiative with the DCM Shiram group in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh, which is the biggest sugar growing region covering five districts uh, where, uh, you know, the, the whole uh, focus was on sustainable sugarcane development to increase productivity. So that also addresses the income part of it. And there are small holder farmers, which adds to the complexity, good agricultural practices, rural entrepreneurship, focusing hugely on training and capability building of farmers, especially women. And with this project was able to reach 50,000 small holder farmers across 38,000 uh, hectares of land. So these are just two examples. There are a number of others, but this kind of demonstrates how there is, you know, the, the, the human rights team works with the sustainability team to look at how we integrate and, you know, address issues holistically. And it's been a journey for us. We've also learned, uh, you know, going from silos approach to looking together and working together. And we find that far more far powerful and far more, you know, addressing uh, these complex issues in, in a holistic and integrated manner. 
Thank you very much, uh, Shuba, uh, for, for the very concrete examples. Indeed, uh, it's been a journey and that journey will continue. Uh, uh, and and I, I, I really hope with, uh, with even greater successes. Uh, I invite all the participants to please uh, uh, stay with us uh, at least five more minutes. Uh, and because we have uh, um, another panelist, uh, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Farouk, that I want to come back to with a question similar to the one I asked uh, Shuba, which uh, elaborated on, on the uh, role of multinational, of the modality in which multinational enterprises uh, connect the dots between the UNGPs and the, and, uh, and the 2030 agenda strategies. I'd like to ask the same question to Ms. Farouk, but perhaps look at uh, um, MSMEs. Uh, they have perhaps also an additional challenge uh, and perhaps even some uh, additional opportunities for that. So I'd like to ask that same question and ask for some good example um, of, of um, MSMEs uh, that have uh, successfully uh, tried to connect uh, the dots between their objectives to further the 2030 agenda and at the same time uh, uphold uh, human rights uh, standards. Um, Mr. Farouk, uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I will be very brief and, and, and precise. I know we are uh, extremely running against the time. Uh, anyway, uh, particularly uh, in terms of the uh, uh, small and uh, medium enterprises. You know, capacity building is an extremely important issue. Most of the small and particularly medium enterprises in our region, be it in India, in Bangladesh, or uh, in other part, uh, countries in South Asia, uh, we, have, we lack very much in terms of capacity. So uh, our internal capacity building is extremely important. And for that reason, there was a question also, I would briefly touch upon the question also for that internal capacity building of the enterprises, uh, proper, <coughs> excuse me, uh, good governance, uh, transparency, innovativeness within the enterprise itself, uh, setting common goals, interactive decision-making system, uh, proper uh, allocation and reallocation of internal resources and least, uh, uh, last not but the least, the training system uh, should be developed for internal capacity building. This is uh, number one. Uh, number two, uh, 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 access to finance is a big challenge in our part of the world. Uh, well, uh, uh, each and every country must come forward in easing up the access to finance policies. There are many innovative ways uh, these days, particularly COVID has uh, uh, taught us many good lessons in that, in that context. Uh, so, uh, those should be uh, taken into uh, consideration. The uh, third, third issue uh, is huge informality, is a big challenge in, in, in our part of the world. 90% uh, of, of the economy in most of the countries fall in the informal sector. So gradual transition from informality to formality uh, is extremely important. Uh, uh, and uh, finally, uh, some of the good examples, uh, particularly uh, there were uh, some of the enterprises uh, had been trying to follow good uh, cases, uh, like for example, in one of our uh, enterprises, uh, there are many, but I've just named a few. Uh, one of the uh, enterprises in the RMG sector started with a separate mother care program, uh, uh, supported by some of the development partners to take care special uh, care, particularly the nutritional health of the uh, female workers. So, uh, and that's uh, still being uh, continued. Uh, in uh, some of the uh, enterprises, they opened up eye camp uh, for uh, periodical treatment, uh, optimal treatment uh, of their uh, workers. Uh, during the COVID particularly, many of the pharmaceutical companies or even uh, many of them are members uh, of the Bangladesh Employers Federation, they got involved into the philanthropic activities, including the Bangladesh Employers Federation itself, uh, in terms of uh, uh, COVID uh, support. So uh, there are many examples uh, which uh, uh, can be uh, taken into consideration. Ultimately, they are contributing to the fulfillment of, of SDGs. And as I mentioned during my first intervention, that a system of reward and recognition uh, should be there so that people are encouraged to come forward at a larger scale. Uh, thank you so much for giving me the floor. 
Thank you. Thank you, Farouk. Extremely clear and to the point. I have I filled a few pages of, of comments and, and uh, inputs from all of you uh, panelists. Uh, I, I, I thank you warmly for, for your great contributions. And of course, I thank all the participants for their uh, views and, and questions, all of which are registered. My promise to you is that everything that was discussed today will be consolidated uh, in, a, in, a, in a short uh, document that I will uh, make sure that those working on the roadmap for the next decade uh, receive. I'm sure they'll find it very valuable. Uh, I'm only sorry that we were not able to uh, talk about leaving no one behind, more specifically the question that I had asked uh, 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 um, to uh, Priyanka, but I actually uh, promised that perhaps LNOB will become the focus of a dedicated question or the liquidity session. I think it deserves that perhaps in the Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum, uh, which we will be organizing in June, uh, uh, and then you probably are all familiar with. So stay tuned on the connection between uh, 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable uh, Development Goals. I thank you all, and I, and I do invite you to remain connected uh, uh, with the forum. There are many more sessions coming up that I'm sure you'll find interesting. Thank you very much.